welcome the church in the village this morning, if you'll stand with us. We're going to do some Christmas stuff this morning. If you take a moment to greet your neighbor, give him a wave, a hug, a high five, whatever you want to do. Do that awkward elbow thing. Right. <laughs> Is there a name for that yet? Do we have a name for the weird corona elbow? Rona bow? <laughs> High five, so that's, I mean, asking, it's like ADHD level right there. My son keeps trying to teach me, but I was homeschooled, so high fives <laughs> don't work for me. Is this how high sc- homeschoolers high five? Like that. <laughs> yeah. Because you're all by yourself. It's so bad. He's like, Mom, how do you not know how to high five? Still, still don't have it. <laughs> 
This is a new song that we're going to be doing for Christmas Eve Eve service. So you guys get a little practice before then. So just kind of take your time learning it. It has a really beautiful chorus. It says, Gloria, Gloria, I hear the angels singing. It's kind of beautiful because it reminds us of how the angels brought in Jesus' birth and singing. So let's sing this together. It's called Face of God. Underneath the starry sky. That's all right. Amen. And this last one, you all know, it's an oldie, but it's a real goodie.
Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much this morning for the moment when you stepped out of heaven and took on the form of a, a little baby. What that night must have been for creation. Lord, let us just see a glimpse of that this morning here in this building or in the homes. Let us silent everything that's going on in our brains, our hearts, and our souls. Take away the, the anxiousness of this time. Take away the stress of this time. And fill it with you. Lord, as just singing that song, a silent night, a holy night, I pray this morning that we have a silent morning as we listen to your words and plug in this morning look for you so, so we pray that you just show up in our lives show up when we need you the most we know you will we ask this all in your son Jesus Christ's name amen you may be seated kids you can head on over I think you've already went um, I opened my eyes and they're out well Henry didn't so um, hopefully everybody's doing well this morning See, there's a few things that I line up, and if it doesn't happen, um, I struggle with it. Like my feet on my stand, I always like to be straight, and it wasn't lining up this morning, so I was struggling a little bit. A couple quick things for you this morning before I get started. Um, the first one is, um, tomorrow we will have my, our, our um, village crossing at our house be the last one. Well, maybe. We'll see. We'll see what next week brings. Um, that's just the 21st, so I still got a few days there. But uh, we will be meeting in our house at, at 6.30, and also um, I'm pretty sure maybe Tuesday they're going to have it this week um, here at the Ministry Center at 6.30. As you can tell, I'm still tapping the feet down here at the bottom. So um, um, so that leads me into the next couple things. Next week would be our normal annual Christmas breakfast here at the Ministry Center, but since 2020 is not a good friend this year we will not be having our breakfast our, our um, Sunday breakfast before Christmas but I'm going to challenge you we won't actually be meeting here next week um, we're going to kind of take that off I like to give the team a little bit of a rest before they got to lead us in, in Christmas Eve Eve so here's my challenge to you next Sunday I will throw out a live a little devotional like I do every Christmas breakfast that we've had here um, but I challenge you to actually wake up and have breakfast with your family around the table. Um, if that's something that, that you're not accustomed to, even at our house, I got I got up yesterday, and me and Nicole kind of go back and forth throughout the week uh, preparing each other's breakfast for each other, which this week Nicole made a breakfast casserole, so it's really just popping it in the microwave, so it's not really, she did all the preparing last week. But, um, but I watched yesterday, I sat in my chair, Nicole sat on the couch with the dog going in between us trying to get his breakfast, and... Um, and by the way, we do make him whatever we make. Um, that's Nicole was never a dog person, but he gets scrambled eggs almost every morning. Um, but I challenge you next week to, to intentionally get around a table with your family. Just to take a moment of pause before this. And you can have whatever you want for breakfast. I mean, if it's leftovers from the night before. Um, Brody's breakfast this morning was um, Nash Mike's Nashville hot chicken. That's what he ate. But if that's what you want to eat, all I challenge you to do is to do it together. And I'll shoot out a quick um, Christmas devotional, take a day of rest, to take a Sabbath where you can just look at, at, at what Jesus has done by coming, on, coming to earth. And then that leads me to a week from Wednesday, Christmas Eve Eve. Um, our Christmas Eve Eve service will be at 630 at the Carlisle Schools. Um, we'll have some people directing you where you need to park at. It will be a drive-in style. Um, we are going to do the candle thing. We're going to have a candle lit singing at the end. It, it'll be lights, and you'll be singing with lights in your car that won't burn your car, I promise. Um, just pull in. We'll have some people guiding you there. You'll be getting your light, <laughs> your candle. Um, you'll be getting a songbook. 
that kind of go through that. Um, if we can figure out a nice way to project the words, we'll have them projected, but you'll get a songbook, and you'll be led to a parking space that will get you right dead center where you need to be. Um, as we're looking into this last book of, of, or this last chapter of Luke in 24, um, I, I start thinking about Christmas presents. I'm a big, like I like to try to find the present every year for Nicole that makes her cry. Um, last year was a, a good one. I got a sign. She's big into Cardinals, you know, because Cardinals can remind you of the one that, that died and, and went to heaven, and they say they're visitors to heaven. So I got this sign, and I knew she was going to cry because she thinks of her dad every time. And then I have to tell this story. It's a rabbit. This is a rabbit I'm going to chase a little bit. So she always believes that Cardinals, you know, she's like, it, it's not that she believes that's her dad visiting, but it lets her think of her dad. Well, a couple of weeks ago, a Cardinal just slammed head first into our back door. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so dramatic, she had to throw it. I mean, she had to, she had to throw it away before Simon ate it. And Nick was like, oh, no. But we've had some Cardinals visit since then, but I always try to find that one. <laughs> I'll try to find that one gift that's going to make my wife cry, right? And I feel like I've got it this year. But really, when I, when I look at the things that I buy, or my mom and dad, or Brody and Lily, it just seems like the ordinary, ordinary ones are the ones that we enjoy the longest. It's not that big, just boom, tug at your heartstrings. Um, we bought a t-shirt for my mom a couple years ago, and it just had um, something about Grammys on it, and it just had all the kids' names on the shirt, and she wears that shirt all the time. That wasn't even a big gift that year, right? Um, Craig always gets Heather glasses and forks <laughs> every year. Every year, but they get used for a year, and then they disappear so he can get some more glasses and forks every year. But uh, um, But it's those ordinary ones that just last the longest like pjs and socks and 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 just all that kind of stuff that that you look like that you wouldn't enjoy but they become the ones that you enjoy um and it's crazy for me it's a it's a pair of pajama pants that i got when me and nicole first got married and i've wore them that's 16 years ago and uh and i've wore those for 16 years and i'm thinking about what my first gift was when we were married that I got from her and I can't really think I can remember when we first dated she got me a PlayStation 2 that was awesome um and I use that to like crazy but but it's the ordinary stuff it's it's just the things that we just overlook sometimes and as we're on these hill journeys together it's easy to overlook the ordinary in our lives because we're always looking for the extraordinary that that just boom light up our path but as we see, Jesus typically uses the ordinary for extraordinary purposes. So as we open up Luke 24, we're going to start in verse 13, going to read a long passage, and I told you we're going to finish. We're going to finish Luke by the end of the year, so Sunday, December 27th, will be the last sermon that will be in Luke, and then the following Sunday will be our first sermon in James. You might say, well, why do you want to go in James? Well, you'll see why we go straight from this to James. And verse 13 says this, that very day, now we'll go back to what happened last week, the very day that the, the tomb was empty, that the ladies found the tomb empty. Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood there looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Verse 24, some of those who were 
with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, I love that. Because there's times in my life I feel like Jesus said, hey, hey, stupid. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just a nice way that Jesus just said, hey, stupid. Right? O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures of things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. So they went the whole seven miles, right? I want you to picture this. So seven miles, walking and talking, somewhere around there would probably take a couple hours, I would believe, um, somewhere around there, maybe if they were moving fast, a little under two hours. He acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Verse 30 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. That's why I just want you to understand, because there's so many scriptures in the Bible where Jesus just took the bread and broke it. And here's why it's one of my favorite verses. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight, which we'll find out in two weeks, where he went as soon as he vanished. And they said to each other, did, our not hearts burn, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened up the scriptures? And they rose that same hour. Now realize, they just walked two and a half, a couple hours. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those that were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Underline that or highlight it if you got your phone out. Known to them in the breaking of the bread. So here it is. Jesus makes his own, makes his first appearance to some of the disciples. Really recorded in the Bible the first appearance to any disciples, and it's not really the main characters. We learned last week that Jesus doesn't really function the way everybody else does. He didn't go to the main characters. He went to two guys that were walking on the road back to Emmaus. They weren't the, the, the 12, now the 11. They weren't, he wasn't, they weren't one of those guys. They were just guys that kind of followed at a distance. They weren't in the inner circle. And here's the thing. When he, when he first gets to him, he just approaches them. He's on the outside of these two men on the road of Emmaus. Jesus just sat back and listened to these men as they recounted what they saw happen over the last few days. And then Jesus asked what they were talking about. There's times in my life this isn't really in here that I think Jesus just asked me what I'm talking about. What am I thinking about? Because I'll go days and days in the cold nose. You'll see it on my face. You'll see it when I clam up because that's who I am. When things are bothering me, I just clam up. Probably not much different than most men in this room and at home. We just feel like that's what we're supposed to do. And Jesus asked that magical question, right? What are you talking about? By the way, men aren't supposed to do that. I shouldn't say that. We should be just as open as everybody else. Jesus gives us that in this. This led to them wondering where this man had been, this man had been all week. There's times I get asked questions out of school. And, and I'll just say, where where have you been, <laughs> right? Um, and then I, look, I realize these times of days, well, you could be in your room for 14 days until somebody tells you you can come out. But hey, that's where I've been. But you, they're like, where have you been? And then all of a sudden, Jesus turns to the Word of God. He turns to the Scriptures, and he explains why the Messiah had to come and suffer and be rose from the grave. And here's what happened. When they stopped where they were going and Jesus was going to keep going, they just wanted to hear more. So they literally grabbed him by the arm and said, stay with us, which led them to having dinner together. So two questions as I get going this morning is, the first is, why the ordinary? Why the ordinary? Why is Jesus always working in the ordinary? And then the second one is, how do we live in Christ? 
Why the ordinary routines? I'm a routine guy. All right, when I, when I was coaching football, I did the same five drills every day. I did a footwork drill. I did an eye drill. I did a ball skill drill. I did a brake drill. And then I did a tackling drill. Every day, five straight days. And I feel like I was pretty good. I feel like I was successful at doing that. Um, I eat the same foods every morning. Like if Nicole makes the, the casserole, we'll eat that for about six, seven days. If not, I get up, I make Nicole one scrambled egg, I fry myself one egg, I make the dog a scrambled egg, and then we eat a half an English muffin every day. I eat it every day. Sometimes I get bored on a Saturday and I'll eat a peanut butter wrap with bananas. Ooh, but that's still a routine. <laughs> Right? I mean, I literally do the same thing every day. Nicole knows it. I'm a routine guy. If I don't do it right, everything seems out of whack. Um, like setting up for church, Matt will come in and help with, and if he can't come up and it's, it's, it's getting late on Saturday, I start freaking out. Yesterday was like 2 o'clock. I just watched a heartbreaking basketball game um, with Brody. So me and Brody came up to to set up no Notre Dame game yesterday. Well, there was. That was a heartbreaking game. That was a hard one because I'm a U.K. basketball fan. Notre Dame beat them. So there you go. I don't know how to react when that happens. <laughs> but um, if, if it gets too late on Saturday and I have it set up, I'll freak out. Routine. I'm a routine, and it seeps into my family too. My family does the same things every day. We get up. Me and Nicole eat. Lily gets up. Her and Nicole fight about brushing hair. It's the same routine every day. But here's what happens. <laughs> here's why I know it seeped into my family. If we do something different, it freaks my family out. If we go a different way to Kathy's house of Hamilton, it freaks them out. Where are we going? I don't know. And the dog and the cat even feel our routines if they're not right. If we come home late, normally on Saturday. <laughs> so even in our downtime on Saturdays, we do the same thing. About 4 o'clock, we go, hey, let's go to Target. <laughs> hey, let's go to Walmart. Hey, let's go. And if we don't do it, our pets freak out. Simon was going nuts before we left yesterday. We all have our routines that we like. So here's the thing. When I, when I think about why the ordinary, so don't you really think that God would want to work in those routines for us to see his glory more than the extraordinary? Because we do our routines and we have the ordinary every day and God wants to show up because when he shows up in our routines, it's personal. Right? We want God to show up like the angels to the shepherds. But what happens was, with them, it became personal after they saw Jesus and it became a part of the routine to tell everybody about Jesus. But us, when we see the extraordinary, we're like, gosh, God blessed me. But we don't look for him in the everyday ordinary and then we feel like God's distant because he's really working in the ordinary. Because his death, burial, and resurrection was and is necessary for all to now have an unbroken relationship with the Creator. Let me say it again. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was and is the only way we can have an unbroken relationship with the Creator of the world, God himself. It's the only way. But here's the coolest thing about that. It was done for all, but it's revealed to us individually. For everyone in this room and at home, it's revealed to you at a different point or in a different way than it's revealed to me. Because it has to be an individual choice to follow. There was a movie in the 90s called The Bachelor. And wow, we've got a show called The Bachelor now. I'm telling you, it's, it's all full circle. But this movie, if you guys remember, it had Chris um, O'Donnell in it, who was like Robin and Batman. He's in uh, NCIS LA now with LL Cool J, right? Is that the guy? I think so. Um, and he had a rich uncle, and this rich uncle was going to leave him like $25 million. But he had to get married within 10 days of his death to get the money. And he had a longtime girlfriend. But here's what happened was, right? The whole movie about this was his friends and everything threw a billboard ad and all this stuff ad in the newspaper so he could get married within 10 days. And what do you think happened? 
They put the little detail in there. Hey, if he gets married in 10 days, he will get $25 million. So what do you think happened? The first scene after the next morning when they put this ad out because the girlfriend just said, I wasn't, she's not ready. And the first scene as he wakes up the next morning is women in wedding dresses flooding his apartment in San Francisco. And it's him running, right? And he, he had this issue with like he, he felt like he was a tied down. He was like a, a stallion that didn't want to be tied down. And they always kept showing that. And I, that, that popped in my mind because at the end of the day, we feel like Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is like that ad. It's for everybody. But ultimately, that marriage for that man in that movie was a personal choice of who he wanted to marry. And for us, yes, his death, burial, and resurrection is for everybody, but it now becomes our personal choice to follow that. Not just a net that he grabs us up in. It's a, it's a rope that we latch on to him. Matthew 18, 13 says this, And he finds it. Truly, I say to him, he rejoices it more over the 99 that never went astray. And of course, we know that is from a song, right? But it's also from the Good Shepherd. And Jesus explains the good shepherd is, hey, if I lose one sheep, if I have 100 and I lose one, I'll go after that one. If I lose 70, I'll go after the 70. That's the personal relationship that we talk about because God knocks down our routines and it has to be personal. If it was this grand scheme and this extraordinary that we always see, we miss the personal relationship we have with God. He uses the ordinary routines in our life to become extraordinary ways to experience in him, breaking bread. It was dinner. It was dinner time. Jesus broke the bread. Their eyes are open. They see Jesus. Meeting blind men on the road. The, the, The biggest miraculous thing about meeting and healing the blind man on the road, Jesus just spit on the ground, put mud in his eyes. It wasn't that he just hit him in the forehead and said, see, he literally just made a mud pack and put it in his eyes. He met the blind men and the beggars. He met them where they were at on their daily routines. The feeding of the 5,000. Right? The feeding of 5,000. You think, man, he fed 5,000 people, but it was legit. He took like a Lunchable, and he just started handing it out. It wasn't just all like stuff started falling out of the the sky. This little kid had basically a Lunchable. He had some sardines, and he had some roll-ups. I don't know if they had the cookie in it or not. That'd be cool if it was, but maybe one day. But, but he took this, and all of a sudden, they just start handing it out, and it just starts appearing. Yes, that's extraordinary, but it was an ordinary lunch that he used, the bread, the meal with these two men. Just an ordinary time. They met a stranger on the road. They invited him to have a meal, and then all of a sudden, God showed up. And the Bethlehem star. The star over the manger that signified the Son of God has arrived in form of a baby to the wise men. And you might say, well, that's a big deal, is it? Because those wise men, those three kings, their whole day was consumed of looking at the sky. They knew every star. They knew every constellation. They knew everything around there. And they looked up one day, and there was something out of the ordinary in their daily routine. And they said, what is that? And so they chose to say, okay, I need to search out what this is. And they read the old ancient Jewish transcripts of the Bible. And it said, wait a minute here. They said the Son of God is coming and a star will form in the sky. Something extraordinary out of their ordinary. Everyday routines that get interrupted by God become divine moments that change lives. We just need to respond by submitting our ordinary routines to his divine plan of redemption. That's how we respond as a follower. That's what a follower does. A follower just says, you know what? I'm submitting my everyday routine to you so it can now be part of your divine plan of redemption. Paul David Tripp says this, Embedded in the larger story of redemption is a principle we must not miss. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things in the lives of others. We have to be willing to allow our routines to be interrupted by God. 
but also be allowed to put our routines and our ordinary day in God's hands so he can do something extraordinary about it, with it. You want to talk about an ordinary day? Every day I go to school, it's just a plain ordinary day. Some people's like, well, you work with teenagers. Well, I'm just telling you, teenagers after a quarantine pandemic aren't the same. For you guys that's been in school, they just kind of sit there. They don't know what to do anymore, right? It's a sit on their phone, number one, for a study hall guy. Hey, you can have your phone. That way you're not loud and I don't have to tell you to be quiet. But there's just... It's it's an ordinary day. I go in. I do the same thing every day. I go get the Chromebooks at the kids that need Chromebooks. I have two little helpers, Balaam Brown and Lily. We push a cart, and we go get Chromebooks, and we bring it back. They go get their breakfast. I sit there and help Lily with homework. It's just an ordinary day. But here's what happens when you look at that ordinary day. You have to prepare as a follower of Jesus to have interruptions in that plan and that routine. You have to prepare for it. Because that's where God shows up in the interruptions. These guys just wanted to go home and see their families. They just saw the most horrific thing that they've ever seen in their life. They even said it. They were just walking sad. I don't know what that means. I picture it like probably Charlie Brown. You know, we, th- we <laughs> any Charlie Brown, of course, the most famous Charlie Brown show is probably on tonight. It's usually around this time. And he's just always walking like this. <laughs> I mean, it's just Charlie Brown. And I imagine these guys are just walking. They're just like, where's all the hope now? And then all of a sudden, Jesus started revealing himself. They allowed some margin in their everyday routine for God to show up. And we've got to understand that this larger story of redemption, we're a part of it. We get a part to play. Yes, we didn't do the hard work. Jesus died and he rose again to allow this to happen, but we get a part to play in this redemption story of bringing things together. We just got to be willing to allow the ordinary to kind of get shaken up a little bit. Or just going and allowing it and not just saying I'm too busy. Tuesdays are my days where I I usually put sermons down on paper. This year has been different for me. I still do it on Tuesdays, but normally I'll go about two, three weeks ahead. Sometimes that's why I haven't been able to send Amber my sermons because I'm not going two, three weeks, four weeks ahead. I've been going week to week for the last six months. And and I don't know, for some reason I just put it in my head, I'm going to preach all 52. And I did. (laughs) But no, um... That's nothing to be proud of. It's because for me during this time and this craziness and this pandemic, it's intentionally made me to seek where God is, which will lead to the second point here in a second, to seek where God's working in my life. And if I'm writing a sermon during my day at school, I've got to be willing to have some interruptions in that point. I've got to have some i got to be willing to have some interruptions in my day for somebody that needs somebody to talk to. I've got to be willing to have some interruptions in my week that if somebody is struggling or somebody gets hurt or something happens, I can be there for them. God uses that ordinary routine to match you up with people that's in your life, but you also got to be willing to say, you know what, I'm willing to lay that routine down for God's work. Now, sometimes they match up and they match up well. Sometimes they don't. I always talk a lot about coaching football. That's why I always have a hard time. Why, why am I not? I did coach middle school this year, but why? Because when I coached, I just remember 17 people in the years that I coached became followers of Jesus and decided, and they're still following. It's not like they were just like, hey, you know, that was a great word. It was a great service. It was a great camp. It was literally after practice every day. Because, you know, I know Nicole would want me to come home, but I had to leave margin in my life. And it's not just about me. I look at the people in this room and the people at the home watching. The moments that you've left margin in your life, and it's been able to help me, I think, two weeks ago, three weeks ago almost. Actually, almost four. Yeah, it's been three, right? I don't know. Brody, when Brody had surgery, people took time out of their day just to say, hey.
So routines are important, but we can't get lost in our routine and so focused on our routine that we're doing the to-do list that we forget that God's trying to show up in those. We can't be so focused on that big moment where God's just going to speak to me with an audible voice and, and, and look for those moments to open and not understand that he wants to work in that routine as well. Quote when, um, way back, probably 15 years ago, that just has stuck with me. I don't even know who said it. It's been that long. was simply... We can't be so focused on that door, waiting on that door to open for God, and we miss the window that he cracks behind us. Sometimes we get so focused on waiting for the big thing that we miss the thing that he's doing in our routine. Which leads me to the second part of the que- the, the second question, how do we live for Christ? It's really to be plugged in. So to, to live your ordinary routine life, you need to be plugged in. And my favorite, my favorite scene in Christmas Vacation my favorite scene is when Clark finally gets him lights all ready to go, and he's checked them 8,000 times. And he gets everybody together, and he gets them all out, and he plugs them in, and it turns on. And he's like, ah, nobody's out yet. And he's like, come on, come on back out. And he gets them out like three or four times. And he plugs it in when everybody's out there, and he gets so mad, and he starts kicking Santa Claus and, he, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the whole reason why the lights didn't come on was, there was no power to it. And his wife, Ellen, would go out, and she was going out to get some food out of the fridge, and she'd flip on the garage light. And it was like the, the only way that Chevy chased, I mean, that's, he plays the same character in about everything that he's ever in. It's just the facial expressions every time he plugs it in. And those movies, in vacation movies, when they, they did it like six times, and she's like, oh, and then she realizes, and he's like, he does that big, and the power comes on, and it's just awesome. And my, to end that scene is when the grandma starts singing the national anthem. Is that right? Or no, that's the prayer, right? And she's like, <laughs> you know, but I forgot what ends that scene. It was cousin Eddie out there in the, yeah, I forgot about that scene. <laughs> so, um, but that's my favorite scene because there's no power. And here's the thing I know in my life when I'm feeling drained is most often because I'm plugging into the wrong sources. Luke, don't miss Luke 24, 32. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. Their hearts were burning when Jesus was explaining himself through the scriptures. Now, now that, that term, right, that term, why he talked to us on the road, why he opened the scripture. That term open means that like dug in, exponentially dug into the scriptures and explained from Genesis all the way to Malachi. All the way to Malachi, every time that he was mentioned in Scripture and what had to be done. They didn't tell us when Jesus got to the road. They didn't tell us it could have been mile one. There could have been six miles left that Jesus just spoke the Scriptures to them. All the way from the beginning to the end of the known Scriptures that they had. And he just lit them up with the knowledge of here who is the Son of Man, who is me. The Son of God, Jesus the Messiah. But here's what happens to me when I'm feeling drained and I don't have any energy and I don't have that dunamis power, that that dynamite power of the Holy Spirit inside of my life. I'll plug into my routine. If I just keep going, if I just keep going, something will happen. Um, My favorite line is, well, just stage of life we're in. Right? We'll just keep going. And so everybody in this room and I know at home, we're all in different stages of our life. I'm sitting, Nicole wanted to drive because she doesn't, she's teaching remotely right now. And so she doesn't drive throughout the week. So she wanted to drive yesterday. Well, the whole reason that both of us want to drive is, is about three minutes into the drive, the 13 and 10 year old in the back is going to get into it with each other. But that's a different stage than Amber and Brian is in. I'm sure their kids get into it while you're in the car, but that's a whole different getting into it than a 13 and 10 year old. And I think of mom and dad, and I'm like, they never had those problems. <laughs> or now mom and dad will take the kids somewhere. And, and, and I say that is, is because, oh, we're just in a stage of life. We'll just plug into that routine. We'll just keep going in our routine, and it'll get better. God will show up, and it'll get better. 
which is different than giving our routines. It's just I'll plug into my routine. That's where I get my power from if I can do my things daily. Sometimes I'll do it my own power. I'll plug into my own power. Um, I've, I've inherited a great trait from the Clarksons. We just go until we can't go anymore. Until I wake up in the morning and I'm like, when did I start feeling like my dad feels? My legs hurt. My back hurts. Got to have hernia surgery last year. I'm like, that's my dad had to have hernia surgery. I'm young. But it's because it's the trait that I was instilled from my dad, which is a good trait. We just go until we can't go anymore, which means that we just plug into our power and it drains way faster than the power of the Holy Spirit, which never drains. And then there's times I just plug into things that are outside of God's Word. I'll replace God's Word for maybe, and not, they're not bad. Don't get me wrong here. I'm saying this more for my wife. I'll plug into maybe a podcast, which I love. Or I'll plug in and be like, man, if I can just, I'll play a song on repeat. And I'll be like, yeah, there's my power. Anything that's outside of God's word, we, we lose that power. And you might say, well, why is the Bible so important? Why do you need to plug into the Bible? Because if not, we'll keep searching for some sort of power that's outside of it. And we'll just keep going. It's, it's the same principle of in your life. When you know you've empty and you, you know you need God in your life, we continue to be empty because we need to seek God because that's where the power is for us to keep going. We're trying to live a different calling of our life, but we're plugging into the power source that doesn't allow that. When I think of these displays and, and Craig's at the, at the pizza hotline up there, he's got to have extra power to run those. And I was afraid when Jim was singing, I was going to plug our sound in there. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, the people making Salty Dog, who's making um, funnel cakes, plug in too. And I'm like, oh, no, we're in trouble. And sure enough, it popped before you got there. I was like, okay, I better find another source to plug into. Right? So we'll plug into good things, but it's not the source that we need to plug into. And the source of power is just right there. And here, here's what I've changed about my life. I've changed the way I've read the Bible. I've changed it. Before, it was just to get through it. Throw me a chapter down there. I'm just going to read this chapter and we'll get through it. God's going to speak something through me and I'll just get right through it. Now it's like a treasure hunt. I dig through the scriptures where I'm at. I'm in Ezra right now and I dig through those scriptures. I don't get my commentaries out. I don't get that out. I just read, but I look where Jesus is in it. Right? And Ezra is the whole book about where they're building the temple and they're asking permission from the kings and they're trying to do all this kind of stuff. But over and over and over again, you see the gospel. You see redemption. I try to find the character of God throughout it. And then I apply those lessons to my routine and I live by it. Less big pas passages. I've actually went less big passages. And I say that as I read about 30 verses today, but you know. Less big pass passages, and I spend more time on the small batches. Real power comes from seeking God, not just answers. And ultimately, that's where we get drained. Is we try to find the answers, because if we have the answers, guess what? We have the control. Where God says, just seek me. Seek me and trust me as you follow Mark Batterson says this, Finally, I've learned that we shouldn't seek answers as much as we should seek God. I found myself, and I'm probably going to talk about this here in a couple of weeks on, on Christmas Eve Eve. Is I've been asking the question, why, 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 why? When in turn, I should be asking what, 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 and how. What I mean by is a lot of times I'll ask the question, why, why is this happening? Why can't we do this? Why can't I do this? Why do I have to wear that? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to stay at home? Why, do I, why can't I go eat? Why can't I go here? When I should be asking, what's God trying to do through me? What, what's God trying to do in me? What is God trying to show me, and how am I to move forward in this? 
So seeking answers usually typically turns us into our power source of ourselves. But if we seek God, guess where the power source is plugged in? Into Him. So as I ask Amber and Jen to come back up, <clears throat> let us, as we live our hill journeys together, and I'm always going to say that, we should be doing this together. Let us give our ordinary lives to an extraordinary Savior for Him to use it for His glory. And let us challenge each other to stay plugged in by seeking Him. Let's do it together. A simple question we can do that to ask each other each, each week is, you know, what's God, what's God telling you this week? If you know somebody's going to ask you that question, you're, you're intentionally going to seek Him. Or how'd God use you this week? So two questions as, as I end this morning. The first one is, how is God speaking to you in your ordinary? I know how he is me. Um, there's, I share a lot of my life with you guys. How he's speaking through my ordinary, I'm going to keep to me today. But I know how he's speaking. Probably a little less Eric and more him. That's probably what he's trying to say. But how's he speaking to you through your ordinary? Where are the moments in your ordinary where, where you've just skipped over him while you're looking for the extraordinary? And the second question is this. Are you plugged into the right power supply? Are you like me? Um, my, my wife sees it. Nicole sees it. Isn't it funny how God puts the right people in your life and they can just see it? Like your countenance isn't the same. Shoulders are down a little bit, right? The smile's not on your face. You don't find joy in the things that you used to find joy in. You kind of run from the things that you used to find joy in. And it's usually because you're plugging into the wrong power source. And I'm not just saying plugging into the Word, but it's, it's not just plugging into the, the Word. It's seeking God through that Word so you can see the character of God and how He wants to use you. And then be allowed to be used. There's a difference between being tired from doing what God's called you to do and just being tired because you're plugged into the other things. There's a joy in the tired of you, God using you and you doing things that God's called you to do. There's a depression, and a, I won't say depression, but there's a, <clears throat> there's a tiredness that leads to a questioning of why, of... of really just not very joyful it's almost like Saul when God took his hand off of him and they say he just fell into these deep spirits these deep just depressed spirits and he would have David come play music for him right but Saul realized that he quit seeking God like, like if he ever realized that and he was trying to plug into all these different sources well if I kill the one that God's wanting to be king or the people are praising about if he just kept doing what God, he would have been plugged into the source. You've been tired physically, but spiritually you would have been exuberant in everything that you're doing. And, and listen, as a, as, a, as a preacher, some would say that you shouldn't share that with people when you feel like that. But I'm going to tell you, I feel like that at times. I'm drained. But then you don't see any, like when you're turning the corner, you don't see any change in it. You just get tired. And it's usually because I start plugging into the wrong source. I read my Bible every day, but I don't read it intentionally to seek God and how I apply it to my life. I go in and I'll, I'll listen to a podcast. I'll be like, hey, that's awesome. That's about being a good dad. Or it's been... And then two days later, be right back down. I'm telling you, the right power source, the power source like those guys said on the road, wasn't our hearts burning. When our heart's burning, when we sought after God, when we sought after His Word, and then all of a sudden in the ordinary, it just became extraordinary, and they ran seven miles back. Don't miss the point. The same as the birth, as the resurrection. Seven miles back to go tell somebody. There's a connection between plugging into the power source and telling people.
So as I pray, I'm going to ask you to stand. Father, we come to you this morning. And we know that you have lived and you have died and you have rose again for all. But that's personally for me to pick up and follow. Lord, I pray for the strength every day to plug into you and nothing else. Let me seek the face of God. Let me seek the character of God. Let me seek the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, the perseverance of God. That we can be physically worn down, but emotionally, spiritually, and in our minds, excited for the next the next thing you have for us. I give you my life. I give you my ordinary. Use it for your glory. And we ask this in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. She looks upon the great I am. She looks upon the great I am. Gift of heaven. to save the sons of earth He's born to give them second birth Join us this morning. Um, remember, we, we will have Village Crossing tomorrow. Um, no church next Sunday, but we will be online if you want to click in. But I challenge you, really, eat breakfast with your family. Go out, if, even if it's just going out and getting some donuts, go eat breakfast with your family. Um, start, start these holidays off right that way. Um, and we'll see you guys in a few weeks.